thrilled and uh, it's an honor to be part of this uh, presentation uh, today uh, for this big event. Uh, a couple things to let you know uh, what's going on here. I'm going to show uh, a presentation that's derived from this book and uh, it's going to be very video heavy. And we have two rabbis uh, who will be joining us at the end uh, to talk about their experiences. Uh, and so what is this experience? This is about uh, rabbis who have been guest chaplains in Congress, rabbis who have opened sessions of the House and or uh, the Senate uh, in prayer. Again, my name is Howard Mortman. My day job, I'm the communications director at C-SPAN, uh, which is the uh, cable television network that provides uh, live gavel to gavel coverage of Congress, uh, as well as uh, uh, much in Washington, White House uh, and hearings and so on. Uh, that's my day job. Uh, my Jewish background is uh, I've, I'm from the DC area. I grew up in Temple Micah uh, here in Washington, DC and now belong uh, to Temple Road of Shalom in Northern Virginia. Uh, this is, so this topic is both, for me, uh, Mary is both my uh, working at C-SPAN and my Jewish background. I'm being assisted here uh, by my, my daughter, Mia. Uh, she appears on the screen as tech support. She is gonna run this presentation. So again, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go through this, ex uh, explain what it, uh, the history and the tradition of, rabbi, of what it means for a rabbi to pray in Congress. Uh, and we have two real life rabbis who have done so, uh, who I'm gonna pull in at the, uh, the end of the conversation. Um, so, you know, I'm sitting here in uh, Northern Virginia uh, in the suburbs of Northern Virginia, of DC uh, in the basement of our house, like everybody else. Uh, I have roughly about 25 minutes worth of video to go through. It's gonna be a couple different uh, YouTube. So I'm just gonna get started. And hopefully, um, one other thing, um, uh, question while well, leave time. I'm trying to do my best to leave time for as much questions as possible. Uh, at the end of this presentation, my daughter Mia is no longer going to screen share, and then we're going to see on the screen the two rabbis. Uh, and then probably, if I have this right, turn it back over to Steve Rabinowitz, uh, who is going to be the host at that point and moderate all the questions. So let's have the fun start right now. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, new book when rabbis bless Congress out today. Every session of Congress. Uh, begins every legislative session of Congress begins with a prayer. This has nothing to do with rabbis, but I want to go. I want to start big and just show you uh, what it looks like uh, and, uh, before even the Pledge of Allegiance is said. There is a prayer said uh, by the chaplain, uh, both the House and the Senate. We'll show you a quick video of what that looks like typically. Chaplain, the chaplain will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Mighty God, you are our dwelling place, and underneath are your everlasting arms. May our President and First Lady feel your healing touch. May our Senators, who are dealing with the personal health challenge of COVID-19 also experience your divine healing and comfort. Lord, we trust in your support for you continue to be the source of our hope and peace. Give us great faith as we feel you near, even in the darkness. Lord, provide our lawmakers with such fortitude that they can walk calmly through life's storms. We pray in your wonderful name. Amen. Okay, so that is... Um that's every, again, every session of Congress begins with a prayer. That's typical in the sense that, that is the chaplain of the Senate, Barry Black. Uh, in the House of Representatives, the chaplain is Patrick Conroy. Uh, a little atypical, you normally don't see masks uh, and you normally don't see uh, the chaplain praying for the health of the President of the United States. So uh, a little atypical in the messages there, but that's standard how, um, how each session of Congress uh, begins. And again, this was October 5th, um, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, let's go to the next slide. 
So that's a chaplain begins every session of Congress. To hold on. Uh, okay, a quick history of prayers in Congress. The tradition goes back to the very beginning. A uh, quick timeline here. Uh, the very first things that uh, Congress did and the Constitutional Convention did was was advocate for prayer and create chaplains. So this the tradition of uh, opening uh, Congress in a prayer goes back uh, to the very beginning. And you see at the bottom of the timeline here, even before the Bill of Rights uh, was completed, uh, they had done uh, the work to elect a chaplain um, uh, and to have prayers leading legislative sessions. Guest chaplains. So chaplains, uh, again, part of the official structure of Congress, paid for by taxpayers, they have a staff. Guest chaplains, the tradition of someone uh, uh, filling in for the chaplain, that tradition began in the 1850s. And the first, now we begin our story. The first rabbi guest chaplain was in 1860. And that gentleman's name was Morris Raphael, February 1st, 1860. James Buchanan was president, it was even before Lincoln. And he gave a lengthy prayer in the House of Representatives. Uh, rabbi Morris Raphael, uh, born in Sweden and came from uh, Congregation B'nai Jeshurun in New York City uh, and gave a very lengthy uh, prayer uh, it was kind of a shock. No one ever seen uh, someone looking like that before. The newspaper accounts at the time said that he had dressed in costume and people were shocked to have uh, someone who was Jewish lead a prayer, but he was the very first one. And uh, now I'm gonna show a more, so that was 1860. Let's speed up the timeline to 2007 and see him more contemporary prayer opening the House of Representatives. On this day, signed Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House of Representatives. The prayer today will be offered by the guest chaplain, Rabbi Alan S. Wolensfields, Congregation, Congregation B'nai Israel, Tom's River, New Jersey. Ruler of the universe, bless our leaders with an understanding and discerning mind, a listening ear, a compassionate heart, and insightful thoughts. We thank you, O oh God, for enabling us to live in a free country and we remember those who do not yet live in freedom. We pray that the leaders of our country help those who suffer in the hands of others and come to the assistance of those held in captivity. We thank you, God, for the confidence the constituents place in their elected leaders. This week in many communities, we conclude the reading of the Book of Numbers the ends of the desert journey of the Israelites. We learn from their example that life is a journey. Let us make each day meaningful, different than the one before, helping others and moving towards a life of peace and freedom. We ask God's blessings upon the men and women who serve in the House of Representatives. May God bless you and guard you May God show you favor and be gracious to you. May God show you kindness and grant you peace. And let us all say, Amen. Hold well on. Okay. So a special the treat. Has examined today, special treat. That very rabbi will be speaking on the Zoom uh, momentarily, uh, waving her hand right now. Thank you for joining us, Rabbi. Terrific prayer. A couple of things interesting, just from the perspective of a citation of numbers. Uh, was very interesting. I think, I, I don't have the day, I think that's the only mention of numbers uh, uh, that I'm aware of by a, a prayer given by a rabbi in Congress. So that's kind of interesting. So let's, we'll get more to Rabbi Willens Fields in a moment. Let's move on with our data here. So the big question, everybody's gonna wonder, so how many rabbis have prayed in Congress? Uh, 632 times uh, a rabbi has opened Congress in prayer, uh, uh, starting in February, 1860 with Rabbi Raphael and going through February, 2020. Now, a uh, little spoiler alert, these numbers will change soon and we'll, we'll explain why in a moment here, that number's gonna be up one by the end of the week. Uh, and of those 632 times, 441 rabbis from over 400 synagogues. Now, you're gonna wonder why the difference in numbers? Why 441 rabbis and how do they give 632 prayers? Well, uh, about hundred or so rabbis have given a prayer more than one time. Uh, several rabbis have given multiple prayers. So that accounts for the difference there. Um, in terms of the whole tradition of prayers, uh, even though my research in my book focuses on the rabbis, 
rabbis are generally atypical uh, for being in Congress. Uh, an average of about 7.5 uh, rabbis every year since World War II uh, have prayed in Congress. So it's a big, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a wonderful tradition in our world, uh, but not fully, it's not fully representative of what happens every day. Typically it's a, uh, a member of the Christian uh, tradition who gives the prayer. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next slide. Uh, top synagogues, people want to know right to the numbers. Well, who's, if we don't know, uh, uh, who's winning uh, in terms of the race for being Rabbi Gets Shabbos? Well, here are the numbers. Washington Hebrew Congregation, 24 uh, times a rabbi from Washington Hebrew Congregation has given a prayer in Congress, uh, eight times for B'nai Jashur in New York City, and seven times a rabbi from Addis Israel in Washington, D.C. Obviously, it is even the numbers very heavy toward the Washington area. And, and where do you go to shul, Howard? Uh, Temple Road of Shalom, one one appearance by a rabbi. Oh, in So no reform though. Okay. Yeah, reform. The, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Two things about this slide: um, uh, Washington Hebrew Congregation. I want to point out uh, we're partners uh, in my book. Uh, they basically put up the money to, to fund the publication of it. For that, I'm very grateful uh, for. And second, uh, I have put here in this slide here the congressional record uh, from 1940. Got a big payoff. It looks like. For 19, if you're not ready for a question, answer yet, Steve, but thank you. Sorry. Uh, uh, from 1944, uh, a, a, a rabbi from Addis Israel, again, ranking third, uh, the, uh, June 5th, the day before D Day. And if it, I won't read you the prayer, but the prayer is full of, of it's a very, um, you can only ma almost imagine the sense of history that's looming over the House of Representatives uh, when a rabbi on the eve of D Day goes in and he talks about peace. Um, and uh, there's a great line in here. Uh, uh, we find the way that leads from strife and hate and woe to the upla uplands of fulfillment and creative peace. Um, so it's, uh, it's the sweep of history uh, you can find in many of these rabbi prayers. So again, Addis Israel, the night, the day before uh, D-Day. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. And who, all right, do we know which synagogues? Now, who's given the most? Let's just do the names. Uh, rabbi Arnold Reznikoff, uh, a retired, a uh, chaplain in the U.S. Navy has given the most. As of right now, he's given 16. Uh, we have the honor of being joined on the Zoom uh, by Rabbi Reznikoff as well. Uh, number two, Rabbi Moshe Feller, uh, Lubavitcher rabbi from Minnesota. Um, he's given nine prayers, uh, eight in the Senate, one in the House. Uh, rabbi Arthur Schneier, uh, seven prayers, two in the Senate, uh, five in the House. A Holocaust survivor, uh, now in New York City. And he, although he's passed away, uh, Rabbi Joshua Haberman, of Washington Hebrew Congregation, seven prayers, uh, six in the Senate and one in the House. Uh, and our next slide, another big question is looming. Reform, conservative, orthodox. Well, here are the numbers. 35% of rabbis who have prayed in Congress are orthodox, 34% reform, 30% conservative. Two big takeaways uh, for me uh, when you run the, when you look at the, the, uh, the affiliations. One is it's essentially, it's even, not precise, but it's just essentially a third, a third, a third uh, split among all three. Uh, by the way, the ortho, in the Orthodox um, column, I do include Lubavitchers in there. Uh, about 4% uh, are Lubavitcher, but I have, uh, they are in the Orthodox column here. 1% are Reconstructionist. Um, the second uh, thing that I love about showing this is that there's no requirement uh, when a rabbi is a guest chaplain in Congress for he or she to be of a certain denomination. There's no quotas. Uh, this is a natural filling out of the numbers and basically equal level. I think it speaks to the strength of the community and also the strength of, of uh, the legislative process that there's no requirement for any certain denomination to be there. And this is what happens uh, without that. Uh, we're gonna go to the next slide. Um, I mentioned Lubavitchers. Uh, I, I find them a very interesting part of this. Again, 28 prayers given by Lubavitcher, 4% of all rabbi guest chaplains. Uh, here are pictures of them. And on the next screen, the next video I'm gonna show is kind of a montage just to show you what, uh, what happens when the Lubavitch rabbi opens uh, Congress in prayer. Almighty God, as a descendant of Hasidic Jews who fled the Stalinist regime that persecuted religious observance, I am especially grateful and blessed to be in America, the country called the nation of kindness by the great spiritual leader of our generation, the Lubavitch Rebbe Melech HaMoshiach, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. I would like to take this opportunity to put a dollar bill in which the words, in God we trust, are imprinted 
and for this Pushka charity box. This charity box reminds us all that we have an obligation not only to ourselves and to our families, but also indeed to our neighbors and to society in general. Grant Almighty God that the members of the Senate who assembled here today to fulfill one of your seven commandments, the commandment to govern by just laws, understand that the United States has the ability to lead the entire world. 300 years ago, the great Baal Shem Tov, founder of Hasidism, taught us that in every experience lies divine providence, giving man the ability to find and develop divinity in seemingly everyday activities. As the officers and members of the Senate and their staffs go about their noble task of legislating the path for our nation with the will of the people, please let them see in their work not just mere political activity, but divine endeavor, nothing less than partnership with God in perfecting the world, bringing redemption to all of mankind. So as we may have opinions which differ, let us not waver. Let us be strong, and with God's blessings, we will prevail. Master of the universe, we stand before you in prayer in this month of July, when our nation celebrates its establishment as an independent nation, rooted in the belief in you, O Heavenly Father, as the sovereign ruler of men and nations. Grant, Almighty God, that this nation and its leaders be as cognizant of your presence in their lives as were the founders of this nation. In their Almighty God, so I want to stand up and, uh, pause that video. Um, a couple things, uh, just as a takeaway from that. Again, it was just, I just had more rabbis here. Um, you heard the mention of Rabbi uh, Schneerson, uh, the Rebbe in there. Uh, there have been more, uh, if you look at who, at Jewish figures uh, mentioned by rabbis who have given prayers in Congress, there are more mentions of Rabbi Schneerson than any other Jewish figure, uh, including Moses uh, himself. Uh, that's because of uh, the number of Lubavitchers who have uh, pray, uh, prayed. Uh, and you see here holding up the pushka, the tzedakah box, several of them, as you saw, uh, have begun or ended their prayers of putting a dollar in. They also mentioned, uh, many of them, if not all of them, mentioned the whole Noahide laws uh, in, their, uh, in their prayers, big mention. So we're going to move on to the, um, uh, the next slide here. I want to single out here the rabbinical assembly leaders because one of the hosts uh, of this great event that we're part of. Uh, here is just a quick look at some of uh, the uh, leaders of the rabbinical assembly who have uh, prayed uh, uh, in Congress uh, and uh, over the years. Uh, the, the one, actually, the one that always intrigued me, you see on the top right of your screen, uh, that's Cong uh, Senator Arlen Specter uh, with Rabbi Alvin Birkin of the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. This is the only example that I found in my research where the rabbi actually went into the, uh, uh, to where the senators sit, uh, and he was summoned by Specter to stand next to him. As Specter, uh, who is the sponsor of Rabbi Birkin, uh, made some remarks, sponsor remarks about him. It's actually, it's kind of fun to see uh, standing next to each other. In the next slide, I want to just show an, uh, one video. Here's Rabbi Wolberg giving a prayer in 1988. The Senate will be in order. This morning's prayer will be offered by guest chaplain, Rabbi Jeffrey A. Wolberg, Otis Israel Congregation, Washington, D.C. O oh Lord, we turn to you in prayer. Give us the courage to quarrel, not for petty things, but for important ones. Give us the courage to quarrel with the forces in this world that dehumanize society, that profane existence, that separate brother from brother. But let our quarreling not be destructive, O oh God. Let it be out of love, not envy in order to build up, not to break down. Let our, let our quarrel be with ignorance. Let us quarrel with bigotry. Let us quarrel with hopelessness. Let us be counted among those who quarrel with pain, who alleviate it by sharing it. Let us be among those who are not satisfied with the status quo, who yearn and work for a better world in outer space and in the inner cities of our land. 
May we bring into this world a bit more truth, a little more justice, a bit more sensitivity than there would have been if we had not loved the world enough to quarrel with it out of a vision of what ought to be. May our prayers and our deeds be pleasing to you, O Lord, whose lovers quarrel with the world to perfect itself is our constant guide and our continuing challenge. We add our personal and collective prayers, Lord, for our astronauts. May they ascend in peace and return in peace. Amen. Okay, so a couple things about, two things to point out about this uh, video. 1988, as you saw, um, uh, uh, TV, television in the Senate uh, began in 1986. It's two years at the beginning of, of TV cameras in the Senate. So anything that happened in the Senate before this did not on video. So Rabbi Wolberg is one of the first uh, rabbi, earliest rabbis that we have on video. Um, quick footnote, of course, in the House, Senate t uh, House TV began in 1979. So the same thing, anything that existed happened in the House chamber before 79, not on video. Uh, and, uh, and some of it afterwards we don't have, but we'll have more of that. Second thing, I love the mention of the astronauts in there. Uh, many of these rabbis in the study uh, do mention uh, what is happening in the surrounding world history. Uh, I have a whole chapter in the book about space uh, and rabbis and uh, mentioning astronauts and going back in the Friendship 7 and the Apollo missions and all that. So I first thing I just love is mentioned uh, of the astronaut, of the space shuttle astronauts in there. We're gonna to go to the next slide. And, um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I should have had this real, okay. Uh, going back to rabbinical assembly, here's just some mentions. Whenever a, a rabbi prays in Congress, typically, not all the time, but typically he or she is sponsored by a member of Congress. Uh, and here are just examples of um, member, uh, members of Congress in their sponsoring remarks uh, of rabbis who are part of the rabbinical assembly, mentioning the rabbinical assembly uh, in their remarks. So this comes straight from the congressional record. And again, you can hear this uh, in the accompanying video uh, from, the, um, from the members. I want to point it's nice out- to, It's nice to see your own name there. My, my, my own name. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so that Rabbi Melman, I, I, I'm so happy you joined us. Uh, and this is not planned. This is spontaneous. I uh, just want to assure everybody. Uh, uh, but there again is uh, uh, Rabbi Melman and uh, sponsored by um, Congressman uh, Dole of Illinois. Uh, yeah. Time at the end, Rabbi, I might incur, uh, urge you, maybe I'll speak less and hear more from the rabbis in a moment, but I'd love to. No, this is great. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, I love that. It's nice to meet you. I've only seen you on video on C-SPAN, so it's nice to meet you in person. Um, all right, let's move on. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, uh, I want to point this out. This is really interesting. The first female rabbi, uh, and I'm sure many of you heard historically, uh, Rabbi Sally Prezan, um, she also gave the first prayer by a woman rabbi. And it was 1973. Uh, big sweep of history, part of that day, what, what was happening in the House of Representatives on October 23, 1973. That was the day that the House voted to send to the Judiciary Committee uh, impeachment uh, uh, letters um, against uh, Richard Nixon for the House Judiciary Committee to, to consider. Again, uh, the impeachment process was later, but that was she was there that day. She was sponsored uh, by Congresswoman Bella Abzug, uh, which is, of course, we all know our history of her big role uh, in the Jewish community. So I just, I want to point out this history. Uh, one, uh, uh, um, uh, one asterisk to her appearance, if anybody can spot, this is her congressional record of her prayer. Can you spot the problem uh, with this? Uh, if you know how to correctly spell her name and then see how the, it was incorrectly spelled in the congressional record, uh, and she is the only rabbi who I found in my research who had her name, his or her name misspelled. So yes, she's P-R-I-E-S, Sally. Exactly. So uh, it's tough to find a prayer uh, because of that, but uh, that's wrong in the congressional record. Uh, moving on, um, I, I want to point out how many female rabbis uh, have given prayers, 15 prayers uh, by 14 women, a couple, uh, a couple rabbis, Rabbi Hannah Shapiro, uh, Spiro, I'm sorry, at the bottom here, Hill Havura has given uh, two prayers, um, and I believe she's the only repeat uh, prayer by a, a woman rabbi. Uh, and the next slide, I'm going to go to. Uh, we're going to listen to Congress uh, to um, Rabbi Amy Rader give a prayer um, in 2008. The um, 
Prayer will be offered this morning by our guest chaplain, the uh, Rabbi Amy Rader from the B'nai Torah Congregation in Boca Raton, Florida. Chaplain. When the theologian of my... Next, sorry about that. And if it doesn't work, I will summarize it. I will never be able to do justice. Tradition, Dr. Abraham Joshua Heschel marched in Selma, Alabama with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Rabbi Heschel said, my feet were praying. Esteemed men and women in this chamber, I ask for God's help to move our prayers from our lips to our feet. Our world is in desperate need of action, change, and presence. As the leaders of this sacred democracy, your feet in any one place can make the difference between life and death. May it be God's will that your feet lead our country on the path of compassion and justice. May your feet walk steadily to draw the estranged closer and the vulnerable into protection. May your feet stand firmly and united as the agents of freedom, equality, progress, and hope. Master of the universe, inspire our deeds to be their own prayers. May our work join with God's spirit to bring about a better day for all creation. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thanks, uh, Chairman. Stuck out for me. I, I love the exam in the journal the last days of um, Abraham Joshua Heschel at the, um, at the beginning. Uh, this took on uh, renewed significance uh, a couple months ago when John Lewis died. And um, that citation you heard of marching with your feet was mentioned by several people in the context of that. So this was, this was for me, it was a very historically uh, profound uh, prayer. Uh, we're gonna move to the next slide. And uh, a quick note, uh, rabbis come from many different countries and come to America and pray uh, from non native born Amer uh, rabbis, Poland, uh, 26 prayers delivered by 19 rabbis, Germany, 24 prayers, Austria and Russia. Um, I love pointing this out because in a way, there are many uh, rabbis who survived the Holocaust and came to America and prayed in Congress or left uh, Europe uh, when they were able to before that. So um, that just uh, shows some bit of the variety. Um, Holocaust survivors have prayed in Congress. Uh, on the bottom right, you see my rabbi uh, from Road of Shalom, Rabbi Laszlo Berkowitz, who gave the prayer in 1988 on Flag Day. Um, we also see uh, uh, on the left, uh, Rabbi Isaac Newman, a uh, 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 survivor of Auschwitz, uh, I'm sorry, not of, of, uh, of Auschwitz, um, and uh, prayed twice, uh, in fact, uh, in Congress. Uh, his son, Mark Newman, uh, I must mention, a uh, member of Washington Hebrew Congregation and, and a, a backer of, of the project and of the book. Uh, and then you see just um, mentions of other rabbis who were Holocaust survivors, survived the Holocaust and came to pray in Congress. Um, I want to play a video of uh, Rabbi Romy Cohen. It's a bit lengthy prayer. Uh, Rabbi Cohen gave the prayer on January 29th, 2020. One big, one biographical note, he is a Holocaust survivor. He survived, and not only did he survive the Holocaust, he actually fought the Nazis and killed Nazis, uh, famously as the youngest partisan and killed Nazis uh, in Hungary. Uh, survived, came to America, moved to New York City, uh, and gave the prayer earlier this year, January 29th, 2020, uh, to mark, uh, his prayer was to mark the 75th anniversary of the liberation of, uh, of Auschwitz. So I'm gonna play, uh, depending on time, a big chunk of this prayer. So we're gonna let this run. The prayer will be offered by the guest chaplain, Rabbi Romy Cohen, Congregation Or Heskel, Brooklyn, New York. Sorry, everybody, about the buffering here. Almighty, open my lips. May the words of my mouth declare your praise. With profound humility and deep appreciation, I stand before you. As a young boy of 13 years, I was condemned to be dead, to be murdered, along with my entire family and including my three-year-old little sister. 
by one evil man. May his name be erased forever. But my life was spared. I was saved by my father. By you, O oh Lord, the father of the universe, who brought me to, this, to the shores of this beautiful country, the United States of America, the land of the free, where I found a safe and new home. Okay, I would, I'm uh, pausing it there just for time purposes. Um, to cut to the chase, uh, this story has a very sad ending. Uh, Rabbi Cohn uh, survived the Holocaust, um, did not survive COVID. Uh, he died of coronavirus of COVID-19 uh, in March, uh, two months after he gave the prayer. Um, so, uh, and he was the second most recent uh, rabbi uh, to pray in Congress. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Uh, military rabbis, I love this history of uh, members of the military uh, who have been chaplains in the military and have gone on to be also a guest chaplain as a rabbi in Congress. And several of them uh, wore their uniforms. Uh, we have all the, uh, we have Navy here and Air Force and, um, and the Army represented here. Uh, Morris K. Proud of the Navy, uh, Harold Robinson of the Navy on the bottom right uh, wore their uniforms when they prayed in Congress. Uh, and about a hundred of them, about a hundred uh, military chaplains have also been uh, rabbi guest chaplains in Congress. Uh, a quick note about the content, obviously, that's a big thing. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this part because I want to hear from the rabbis. Uh, Isaiah mentioned the most uh, of all the, uh, when, they, when rabbis mention uh, Torah or, or the Talmud or, or prophets and so on, uh, 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 70 rabbi prayers, uh, Isaiah has been mentioned, one out of every 10. And the most mentioned passage in Isaiah 2.4, nations shall not, shall not lift up the sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. By the way, Isaiah 2.4 is cited not, off, not, also, not only by rabbis, but by non-Jewish uh, chaplains and guest chaplains as well, frequently um, cite Isaiah and Isaiah 2.4. Um, this is, uh, I, I want to steal the thunder of, uh, of Rabbi Resnikov here, but he, Rabbi Resnikov helped me with this slide. Rabbi Reznikov, to quote him, says, rabbis love rules. And here are the rules uh, for uh, governing um, prayers in Congress um, in the House for guest chaplains. Uh, the length of the prayer, uh, no political views, uh, free references, National Day of Observance. Uh, but the one I want to point to specifically is it must be given exclusively in its entirety in English language. I think that's a relatively new uh, rule uh, because I'm going to show you in the next slide uh, an example of Hebrew uh, being spoken in prayer. This is Rabbi Maurice Lyons of St. Louis, Missouri, uh, 1994 in the Senate. We're going to play this video for you right now. The Senate will be in order. Today's prayer will be offered by guest chaplain Rabbi Maurice Lyons, St. Louis, Missouri. Our Father of the arching heavens and undulating earth, ruling in sublimity from the evolution of the first amoeba to the glorious emergence of man. From the morning mist burst of time to its endless mystical haze, thou art eternal and all creation palpitates to thine imprint. While thy rulership holds eternal sway over the universe, we thy transitory children can but exercise dominion over a small portion of this planet thy footstool. Ever since the founding of our beloved country, have we Americans permeated by thy teaching throughout our government for the benefit of all our citizens. And to this end have we selected for regnancy those leaders whom we felt would embrace thine exhortation of love, mercy, and brotherhood. And standing in the effulgence of thy Shekhinah, I feel uplifted by the presence of this august body, the finest of all legislative instruments in supplication to thee. I pray that thou render sharp and universal the wisdom of our esteemed senators, and that it reach therapeutically across party lines and political differences to our common bedrock American heritage. In the reverential language of King Solomon to the God of Israel, I too humbly pray, grant, O Lord, to 
to each of our beloved senators a discerning heart to understand between right and wrong. May their speech and above all action reflect the altruism and glory of the founders of our great country. And in conclusion, I rejoice in pronouncing over this esteemed legislative body the ancient priestly benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance unto you and grant you peace. Peace of heart, peace of mind, peace in all the paths that you may tread, now and forever. Amen. Uh, two quick things on that before we move on. First of all, I thought it was an absolutely beautiful prayer. You heard the Hebrew, the oldest prayer uh, being uh, bestowed on legislators. Um, a very personal note, uh, I, uh, as part of my research, I put all the rabbi prayers that I could find in video on YouTube. Um, this prayer was discovered by the family of Rabbi Lyons who has died. Uh, they were marking his yard site and they were Googling him and came across this very YouTube uh, and they had never seen this before. Me as a researcher, as someone who works at C-SPAN, I had put all these uh, YouTubes on just mechanical process, uh, but it came alive. Uh, and just to be able to connect to this family and connect them with their, grand their grandfather through this video was really meaningful for me. Um, so just a really quick personal note. Uh, I'm gonna move on because uh, I see so many. Um, oh, by the way, I just, here's a nice slide showing examples of Hebrew in the congressional record. Um, again, pre the, before the rule that you can't speak Hebrew, uh, the prayers, but here, it's, a, it's really amazing to see in the congressional record lines of Hebrew in the text there. Uh, next slide, we're gonna move on. Uh, I'm gonna skip this, um, just for time. The earliest prayer I do have in the collection, 1985. Again, this is from the House, Rabbi Haberman, Washington Hebrew Congregation. Uh, House TV again began in 1979. This is the earliest one I could find, only because of time I'm gonna move on. And uh, two more videos. Joining us later in a moment, Rabbi Resnikov, and I'll explain this, let's just let this play. We'll be led in prayer this morning by our guest chaplain, Rabbi Arnold Resnikoff, retired captain of the chaplain court of the United States Navy. Thank you, sir. Let us pray. O God, who made a world of change, you challenged us to change the world. You gave us dreams of better times and the power to pursue those dreams, to do our part to make a difference and help those dreams come true. I remember 20 years ago in a foxhole in Beirut, I looked around at the others in the bunker and had a simple thought. We Americans, I said, must have the only interfaith foxholes in the whole Mideast. And then I thought that if more foxholes had room for those of different faiths, perhaps we'd need less room for foxholes and have more room for faith. During this week, Congress set aside, our nation recalls victims of the Holocaust a Holocaust brave Americans took up arms to fight and many gave their lives to end. We take time now as this week starts and as we pray the fighting, all fighting in Iraq nears its end to honor those who serve, who fight, who sacrifice in times of war so that the time of peace, of real peace, might be. We sometimes call this starting prayer an invocation but it is not your presence we invoke, for you are always with us, no matter where we are or where we go. And on this day in 1881, and in this city, Washington, D.C., Clara Barton and a group of friends founded the American Red Cross to love our neighbor as ourselves, and then to not sit idly by that neighbor's blood, the suffering that he or she endures, without doing what we can to ease the burden and the pain, has been the call to which so many Red Cross workers have responded since that day throughout our land. This week and tomorrow in a special way, Flag Week and June 14th Flag Day, we set aside some time to honor special colors, the colors of our flag. We pause before this session to recall words spoken by a Senate nominee, Abe Lincoln, on this day, June 16th, in 1858. A nation divided against itself cannot stand, he said, and we cannot endure half slave, half free. 
This day, 18 July, almost 250 years ago, the Gazette in Boston published a patriotic hymn, the Liberty Song. Join hand in hand, brave Americans all, by uniting we stand, by dividing we fall. On this date, August 18th, we made progress in the past. We ratified the 19th Amendment, tearing down the wall that blocked a woman's right to vote, did what we do best when we are at our best, made a moral right a legal right, enshrining liberty in law. Today, in 1939, Hitler invades Poland. War spreads, liberty, life denied beyond a chosen few. Humanity itself rejected with the Nazi stamp, life unworthy of life. On this date in 1945, we helped convene a court in Nuremberg, proclaiming some actions so inhuman that they are crimes against humanity itself. We condemned the false belief that any humans are less than human, life unworthy of life. This day in 1971, Alan Shepard hit two golf balls on the moon. First human swings beyond the confines of the earth. At our best, fair play defines our work with some room for playfulness. On this house floor last week, Congressman John Lewis walked across the aisle, honoring, embracing Senator Johnny Isaacson with simple but inspiring words. I will come over to meet you, brother. When we see another not as other, but instead as brother, sister, neighbor, that is cause for thanks. And during these holy days, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, more, some sing different songs, reflecting the beauty, diversity of communities, cultures, faiths that make our nation rich. But as a year, a decade ends, and 2020 begins, may we reaffirm united the hope of Langston Hughes. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Okay, uh, uh, Rabbi Reznikov, 16 prayers. He's given another one this Friday, his 17th prayer. I'll have to update this best of. Uh, really? And by the way, um, he's in the very first excerpt, uh, for, uh, 2002, 2003, I forget. He talks about dreamers and dreaming. And in the most recent prayer, he had talked about dreamers and dreaming. We'll hear from both uh, uh, from uh, rabbis in a moment here. I think I have one more video that I'm going to turn it over because I want to hear. We'll be led in prayer this morning. I'm going to go. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to leave you laughing. Let me just let this, this will speak for itself. Um, this will be the last video that we'll turn it over to the discussion. Uh, go ahead and, uh, and play this. Be in order. And today's opening prayer be a guest of Senator Mark Warner. It'll be offered by our guest chaplain, Rabbi Israel Zoberman, founding rabbi of Congregation Beth Shavram in Virginia Beach, Virginia. The prayer will be offered by a guest chaplain, the Rabbi Wayne Dosick, uh, the Elijah Menhyan, La Costa, California. The prayer will be offered by the guest chaplain, the Rabbi Richard Baruch Rabinowitz, Aish International, New York, New York. The prayer will be offered by the guest chaplain, the Rabbi Thomas A. Lockheim, Congregation Or Kadash, Tucson, Arizona. The prayer will be offered by the guest chaplain, Reverend Erwin N. Goldenberg, Temple Beth Israel, York, Pennsylvania. The prayer will be offered today by our guest chaplain, Rabbi Stephen Roth, a congregation H. Kahim, Passaic, New Jersey. Prayer will be offered today by our guest chaplain, Rabbi Michael Siegel, uh, Anshe Emet Synagogue, Chicago, Illinois. Today's prayer will be offered by a guest chaplain, Rabbi Shem Sean Shero, Congregation Kehoe Zeke Ron Mordecai, Brooklyn, New York. Prayer will be offered by guest chaplain, Rabbi Moshe Feller, Lubavitch, House, St. Paul, Minnesota. Today's prayer will be offered by guest chaplain, 
Rabbi Mel Heck, Temple Beth Ann, Las Vegas, Nevada, a guest of Senator Harry Reid. As Rabbi Harlech mentioned in his invocation, today is significant. It's significant because it's the day of the Shabbat community, important the day in the Shabbat community. It's the 15th anniversary of the passing of Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Shanarison, one of the great Jewish leaders of our time. Rabbi Feller has been a leader in the Twin Cities Jewish community for over 30 years. Accompanying the rabbi today were 20 students from the Habab uh, Academy located in St. Paul, Minnesota. And completed postgraduate Judaic studies at the Lubavitch Yeshiva in Brooklyn, New York. Since 1988, Rabbi Green has ser served as the Lubavitcher Rebbe emissary to Rochester. Madam Speaker, I want to talk about Rabbi Hyman, who just gave the opening prayer. There is a midrash one of the many parables that embellish upon the Torah. In this particular midrash, there is a man from the land of Israel, a businessman who was in another country. I would say that in addition to his spiritual guidance, uh, he introduced me to Cholent, which for this Presbyterian was a new experience. Uh, I think I thank him for introducing me uh, to that part of his history and culture, if not exactly for the culinary experience. Uh, welcome, Rabbi Wiederhorn, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. Okay. And I believe that is that, uh, before, I, before I yield back the balance of my time, um, one second. Okay. We'll be in order. Turn it back over to you then. We are, oh, I'm sorry. I, okay. Forgive me, 10 seconds, then we hear from the rabbis. The plug, I have to plug. I, uh, uh, I've been told I need to plug my book better than I do. It's out today. Please buy it. How's that for a plug? Please buy my new book, uh, When Rabbis Bless Congress, in partnership with Washington Deeper Congregation. First of its kind, never before study of rabbis who've given prayers. And in fact, there was never, hardly ever uh, academic studies of uh, uh, prayers and all uh, in Congress of any, of any uh, religion. And here we go, When Rabbis Bless Congress on sale, starting today. Steve, we're going to turn it over to you to host, and please include now the Rabbi uh, Wolens uh, Fields to start, and then Rabbi Resnikoff, and then everybody else can dive in. So, Steve, we are. In our, I'll remain. Uh, my daughter will no longer be sharing her screen, and Steve Rabinowitz is now the host. Steve. I begin. Rabbi, once you, yeah, Wolens Field, you begin, Rabbi. Go ahead. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much for your book, for your presentation, for Mia, for doing the slides. And I'm very humbled to be asked to be on the panel because um, I know that I was looking to see who was going to be coming and I knew that half of you have also delivered prayers in Congress before. So I was very humbled to be asked to even speak on this. I got my copy of my book already because how often do you get to, can't see it with my back, but to be on a cover of a book, which was very cool. The background story of how I actually got to go to Congress because I'm a bit of a political junkie. It's decreased over the years, but the summer of 1992, when I was in college, I interned for then Congressman Charles Schumer, Chuck, as he was known in my family. My aunt ran his Brooklyn office. I was an intern in Brooklyn and I was an intern for the summer in Washington, DC. Once I came back, I actually, for a couple of years, got roll call at home, which was a really expensive subscription. I only recently threw out some of the copies. So it was like one of my dreams to go to Congress and to speak. I started my congregate, my pulpit in Tom's River, New Jersey, Congregation B'nai Israel, the summer of 2006. And one of the things that the welcome committee did was they welcomed me by having Representative Jim Saxton of blessed memory, who was the congressman of our district, come to the office to meet me. It's like, okay, that's nice. And he said, is there any, if there's anything you ever want me to do, it was like a flip, and com flip comment to me. He's like, but if there's anything I could ever do, I said, I have a dream to deliver a speech in Congress. Almost, I, I was like, you know what? I might as well say what I want. So it was, Almost 10 months later, someone from his office called and said, Congressman Saxton has a time for you to speak in Congress. I was like, oh my God, and he was an older man. He's deceased since he died two years after that. And I was like, he remembered? I couldn't believe it. 
So he got me a date, July 12th, 2007. So I like to say it was BS. It was before Sam. I didn't have my third child then. So it feels like it was forever ago because the little guy has his bar mitzvah this June. And July 12th was an important day in my life because it was my other son, Kobe's half birthday. And we only celebrated half birthdays. He was a year and a half. But I was like, eh, Kobe won't know the difference if mommy's not home. So on July 11th, my daughter and I went to DC. She was three and a half. So she was this little pizzola. A lot of you have met her because now she goes to APAC with me every year and we stay at Jan Kaufman's house. And that's, and um, in the hotel room, she decided, because it's very nerve wracking going to the Congress. I mean, Rabbi Reznikov does it like it's like shita, but you have to give them your speech ahead of time. They review it. They tell you how many words and not speaking Hebrew is actually really hard for a rabbi. So I was really worried about speaking. So at this point, Cameron, not even four yet, had heard mommy practice it quite often. So I'm walking around the hotel room practicing my speech and she made up her own speech. She's like, Ribono Shalom, God in heaven. I pray for peace for my family. It was the most adorable little thing in creation. So you go to Congress and you bring a three and a half year old. What do you do with her? So my position and a lot of people like we're all family here. Richard Hammerman was the rabbi before me in my congregation. His daughter, Leah, of blessed memory, was my daughter's preschool teacher. His son, she passed away in January. His son, Eitan, was a, I think, I don't even know if he was a rabbi yet. He may have just been in rabbinical school. He was in rabbinical school. So he and his wife, Rebecca, so this is her teacher's son, who's now a rabbi, who's in your book, because he's given a few speeches. He was in um, Baltimore. So he and his wife came to DC and they sat with Cameron in the visitor's gallery up above. So she was so excited to sit with Moralea's brother in the visitor's gallery. So during the whole thing, she was able to sit up there. I was able to see her. As Michael Beale said to me, there are not many people in Congress while you're talking. But if you see me looking up during my speech and smiling, that's when I caught her eye in the visitor's gallery. So it was very cool. But the other thing that happened that day, which if you have a second edition of the book, you'll put it in. So I'm on the Congress side on this. And we walked through the rotunda because I had interns for Chuck Schumer. I knew my way around all the buildings and everything. So we walked through the rotunda and I remember seeing someone who was in a Hindu priest outfit. I don't know, sorry, I don't know exactly what they're called. So I remember seeing him that night on the news. I found out that in the Senate side, he was a Hindu chaplain named Rajan Zed from Nevada. He was the first Hindu chaplain to ever give a prayer in the Senate or in Congress at all. And while he was speaking, this is what happened in the visitor's gallery on the Senate side. Now really they could have done it on the House side too, which in hindsight, I'm really happy they didn't because my daughter would have been traumatized. But there were three protesters on the Senate side, two women, I think it was two women and a man. They were charged, charged with causing disruption in the public gallery because as this Hindu chaplain spoke, they started shouting that he was an abomination because the only Lord was Jesus Christ and it's the only true God and he was an abomination to speak. And I remember thinking, oh my God, these people could have actually picked the house side and said the same thing to me, traumatized my child for life. But this was the whole story that took place that day. And I remember like passing this guy in the rotunda, not knowing who he was. I'm almost done. Just few other stories for that day because I knew my way around Congress after I and we took the um, the trolley and the subway in the car and we have an adorable picture it's in my office at Women's League where Cameron's holding hands with the congressman and she's walking along in Congress with him and then after I spoke because quite honestly that speaking engagement takes two minutes you spend all these hours preparing it and then like you have the rest of the day there so I brought her over to the Senate side, and because you could tell I have chutzpah, I went to Congressman to Senator Schumer's office and told them who I was and who my aunt was, because she ran his office in Brooklyn, his constituent office. They said, well, you know what? He's in a Senate hearing now. You can find him in room, blah, blah, blah. So we found the room. I looked up to see what it was. It was a, the Committee on Judiciary. And we peeked in, and I said to Cameron, you don't know who that man is over there, but that's Senator Kennedy. So it was like the coolest thing in creation that I was able to share this with her. This is one part and try to be my last story. Um, so little known fact that they try not to tell too many people. 
the former representative Anthony Weiner started his career with Chuck Schumer. So he was his press person in Brooklyn. So I knew Anthony very well. This was 2007. Anthony was a good guy then. And um, I went to Anthony's office with my daughter. And because I had taken, I took legitimate pictures of him when he ran for, for assembly in Brooklyn for the first time. And we went and his office, they were amazing. They're like, yeah, the Congressman's in, wait one minute. And he came out, he knew me, he said, hello. He took pictures with Cameron. I was proud of those pictures for a little while. And um, we know the rest of the story with him, but it was really such a memorable day for this little three and a half year old. She totally remembers it made it the news in the area. My father-in-law made this whole display and it's in my office, it's laminated and everything. And, it was just one of the greatest experiences. I hope still to be able to do it in the Senate. I've spoken in the uh, New Jersey Senate in Trenton. Cameron came with me again, but she was a little older and one of the senators allowed her to do the vote that day. So that was pretty cool. So thank you very much as again, I'm humbled to be asked to speak since so many of you have spoken as well. And I'll just, sh well, this what time will be the last because I'm amongst friends. The dream of where I really want to give an opening prayer comes from my other child who was a year and a half at that time, which will never happen. But at a NASCAR race, I would really love to give that opening prayer because they have never had a woman. They've never had a rabbi. Our family loves NASCAR. And um, I do actually know the chaplain who does it at the Dover, Delaware race. So Rev Dan and my son and I went with him and he got to sit in Kyle Bush's car once. So. Howard, if you know anybody in NASCAR that I can give the speech one day. <laughs> Rabbi, thank you for that. I would thank you. The comment in a moment. Um, that I will tell you, that's at, everything you just said was so beautiful. Uh, I love the background stories and all that. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. I do want to mention one thing. Thank you for being on the cover of the book. Um, the, the cover of the book designed uh, by Kate Connolly, who a convert to Judaism. Uh, who belongs to the Washington Hebrew Congregation. Uh, her husband, uh, Adam Rosenblatt, designed the PowerPoint I just showed. But anyways, Rabbi, won't feel safe. That was absolutely, my daughter and I were actually just really digging everything you were just saying, all the background stuff. So. Thank, Thank you. Um, Rabbi Esnikoff, as we often say in Congress, the floor is yours right now. Well, uh, I'm delighted and honored uh, also to be part of this. Uh, one of the best uh, things that happened to me through this uh, process of giving prayers was to become friendly with Howard and his family. So I don't know if Mia is still listening, but I send love to all the Mortmans. Uh, I, I, I was almost 29 years active duty in the Navy, starting as a line officer. And then after a Christian chaplain in Vietnam convinced me to think about being a rabbi, uh, I went to JTS and then, you know, back as a Jewish chaplain for 25 years. And prayers always were very, very important in the military, as in Congress, I think, because it's a moment, a challenge to touch the hearts and the minds of the listeners and give a bigger picture. And that's always how I've uh, looked at prayers. Uh, I, you know, you, Ellen mentioned uh, NASCAR. I think. Uh, my most thrilling prayer actually was not in Congress, although every single time in Congress is an honor. Uh, one of the proudest things I've done in my life is fight for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, because of the way Vietnam veterans were treated when we came home. And that memorial ch changed the vision of America, I think, and allowed us to separate our feelings about a war from support for the war fighters. And uh, when Congress gave the land for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, I gave the prayer and a little dedication where 50 people showed up. When we laid the cornerstone, I gave the prayer and 100 people showed up. And then in 1982, when we dedicated the, the memorial, 100,000 people showed up and I gave the prayer. So that was uh, something I'll never forget. In terms of Congress, Ellen uh, mentioned a Hindu uh, guest chaplain. There also have been Buddhist. The Dalai Lama was one of them. There also was one Native American uh, in, uh, woman who gave a prayer. I don't know if people of other religions have given them. Howard, you can add if I've left anyone out. But I just want to say 
that not only do I think the prayers are important, but the um, appearance of a rabbi among all the guest chaplains is crucial. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, but people have written that one reason so many Americans think of Protestant Catholic Jew as the three major religions of America, even though we're only something like 2%, is because veterans came out of World War II and those were the three kinds of chaplains we had. So they thought those were the three kinds of religions represented by uh, America. Wolf Kelman, who was the head of the rabbinical assembly when I went to JTS, told me that he thinks chaplains in World War II were, were the number one factor in the uh, growth of the conservative movement in America, because after the war, when people were, veterans were moving to the different uh, new cities, uh, and they were establishing synagogues, again and again, they came to the RA and they said, we want a rabbi for our new synagogue who was like our chaplain. And one way or another, a lot of the chaplains of different movements in the military ended up holding a service that was kind of like a conservative service back then, a little Hebrew, a little English, um, and to try to embrace uh, everybody. So I think having rabbis as part of this history uh, is crucial. My own father came to America from Russia three years old. My grandfather escaped uh, in almost exactly the same time as the Jews in Anatevka in Fiddler on the Roof supposedly were forced out. That's when my family came to America and my grandfather became a rabbi in uh, uh, Brooklyn. And my father used to say that in his his father, my grandfather's sermons, he not only thank God they made it to America, but that there was an America to make it to. So every time I stand in the Senate or the House, I think to myself, only in America. Um, and that's something, that's a feeling that has been part of my whole life. And I know my father is looking down and he's proud as well. Uh, the rule about the number of words is, is really a challenge for rabbis. And I really try to live up to that 150 limit. But uh, the rule that's the hardest for me is the one that says, you can't start with any stories, just start with your prayer. When I was in the Navy, every time a chaplain was on a ship at, at lights out at night, uh, there would be an evening prayer, only when a chaplain was uh, there. and people tuned out. They just didn't listen to that prayer. So I started the tradition of a story and a prayer. And I got stories I could tell in 20 seconds and then finish it. And I learned that if people remembered the stories, they would remember the prayer. 20 years later, they'd come up and say, I remember when you gave that prayer. So it's very hard for me not to be able to give a prayer. Uh, one other quick note, uh, you'll see that in some of my prayers, I start let us pray. When I was a young chaplain, I resisted saying let us pray because it sounded Christian to me. Uh, then I was the senior chaplain at boot camp and it was part of the ritual when the, when the chaplain got up and said let us pray at the graduation ceremony. That's when the recruits changed from attention to what we call parade rest. They could relax. So I had to say it. So I really struggled and then I thought to myself, wait a minute, Birkat Amazon, Ravotai Nivarech, was saying, let us pray. So I rationalized, I convinced myself that that was okay. Uh, one final note, uh, not only am I so proud to, to meet senators, to meet uh, representatives, but also once the world tilts back a little bit toward normal, I hope those of you who have not been in the house chamber in a while get a chance to visit again because on the walls, there are 23 marble relief portraits of lawgivers who have uh, helped establish legal principles upon which our nation is based. Uh, the one, if you're looking, when you give the prayer and you look straight ahead, it's Moses. Then 11 to the, uh, your right are looking toward Moses, 11 to your left are looking toward Moses. Uh, 24. Now, in back of the speaker, there's another plaque, Daniel Webster, but it's not his face. It's a quote from him. I, I'm proud to say Daniel Webster went to Dartmouth as I did. And I think the next prayer I give, this Friday is the anniversary of the Beirut barracks bombing. So 
I'm going to talk about that. But the next one I've decided I'm going to just stand up and read the words of Daniel Webster as, as the prayer. Um, also, and you're, you'll be among the first to know about this, Steve Rabinowitz knows it, but all of you might want to uh, ad ad adopt this cause if you think it's a good one. I recently wrote to the staff of uh, Speaker Pelosi and said, there are 24 men, uh, 24 including Daniel Webster, 23 portraits. I said, isn't it time that we consider adding a woman, at least one, maybe more? I suggested that perhaps Devorah, Deborah, the first female biblical judge might be appropriate. We already have uh, Moses there, you know, from the Bible, but, you know, there could, there could be many to choose from, but definitely one. So uh, my hope is someone is going to like that idea and we may make, by the way, the marbles uh, relief portraits that are there now were put in in 1949 to 1950 when the house chamber was uh, uh, reconstructed, uh, you know, so it's not like they've been there for 200 years. Okay, thank you again. I'm very, very proud to be part of this. Steve, can I get, can I ask uh, Rabbi Aaron Melman uh, to say a couple words? Uh, only because it's wonderful to, to see you. If you uh, if that's all right, Steve, if I can ask Rabbi Aaron Melman to offer a couple words here about his experience. I'm here. Sorry, just uh, making dinner. Uh, let me uh, plug in my headphones. One of the most amazing things I think is, is that you realize uh, how small uh, the house chamber actually is. Uh, that it's, it, you, you have this vision of, of something really large and grandiose uh, watching a, a state of the union and, and recognizing that, that when you're actually standing at the podium, uh, this place is tiny. And, and even as you look up in, in the, into the gallery, it is, it is tiny. Uh, relative to, to what your mind conceptualizes. Uh, since then, I've been, I've been in the House a, a number of times with, with different uh, members of Congress. Um, I think really the most powerful moment for me, there's two that stand out, um, maybe three. Uh, like Ellen is a, a political junkie, um, being introduced. Now, for those who haven't offered a prayer before, uh, not always, whether it's, as you saw from the clips, not always do you see the uh, the Speaker of, of the House, uh, and certainly not uh, the Vice President, uh, presiding uh, over, over the, the, the individual sessions that, that take place in both houses. Uh, for me, uh, John Boehner uh, was actually uh, in, in the House the day I delivered uh, the address. Um, and, and regardless of, of one's political affi affiliation, uh, to be introduced uh, to the world, essentially, but to the country, and to Congress by by the the third highest ranking uh, member of, of our government is is a pretty powerful thing. Um, he got my congregation right. That was good. Uh, but even if they don't, uh, it's it's still a pretty powerful uh, moment. And to stand actually at at in the same spot where where presidents deliver their their State of the Union addresses and and realizing the power of of the the actual place. Uh, in which you're standing is is something that is uh, no less than than awesome in in the true word of the word awe. Uh, and then I guess the the other powerful moment for me and 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 I I think that this is something that that typically happens, although I, I haven't seen it always when I've seen uh, colleagues uh, give prayers. Um, I happen to have been uh, I, I'm still very close uh, with uh, former Congressman uh, Bob Dold of the. Uh, 10th district of, of Illinois, where, where I've, I've lived for over 18 years now. And um, to, have, to have him as uh, my congressman and friend s speak about me after delivering uh, the prayer uh, in the house was, was something, A, I didn't know was going to happen. It was, it was very humbling and, and very overwhelming. And still to, to this day, one of, the, one, of the, one of the coolest things I've ever experienced. It's, it's really neat. Um, and to, to have a picture with, uh, with, with Father Patrick and, and the speaker and, and my wife and the congressman in, in, the, in the speaker's office uh, is, is really neat. And it's, it's really part of, 
uh, it's it's interesting to just see this and and I ordered the book today. I'm very excited for it. Uh, that so there's one more one more sold. You can tell your family. Uh, you uh, you know I'm 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 excited to to see the the rest of the history uh, having having been a part of it, which is. I guess really fascinating, not having thought about it in that way until until watching the presentation today. So thank you, Howard. Thank you, Rabbi. I, I really appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Um, I, I I don't. I think we're only we're running out of time, and I'm not sure if I can. I see a couple of questions in the chat um, that I I can probably. I don't know if you all can see the chat. Um, a couple of questions in there. Uh, uh, Rabbi Reznikov mentioned Moses at the very center. Uh, one of them, uh, Zev asks, have any cantors ever given a prayer? That's a wonderful question. Not that I'm aware of. Uh, I think, uh, and Rabbi Resikov, you may know better than me, but there's nothing, pro there's nothing precluding a cantor. Well, there, there is. Uh, it, it, the the speaker, the guest chaplain, needs to be ordained. So both the military and the uh, Congress has interpreted that to mean no cantors. When we had a uh, um, shortage of rabbis in the military. Uh, there was some thought to enlarge because other countries allow cantors to be military chaplains. Uh, some countries allow women to be Catholic chaplains, and uh, there was an idea that maybe uh, a lay Eucharistic minister, but the final decision was no, because if uh, we uh, expanded the number of people who could give it, then less uh, ordained rabbis, uh, ordained priests, uh, would be made available. By the way, uh, just a quick note, because we just mentioned the honor of standing there where the president stands. This Friday, when I give the prayer, it will be the first time I've given a prayer where I will not stand in that place. Because of COVID, now the guest chaplain and the house chaplain give the prayer from a table in the audience, not uh, in the chamber, not um, so so close to the speaker or the speaker pro tem. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, Rabbi uh, uh, I'm going to. I see a question in the chat that I want to pose to you. Uh, and this actually, I think we're running out of time, so this might be the final one and might be the most pertinent. We'll get to that in a second. Um, I do want to mention one interesting point. Rabbi Resnikov just mentioned he's going to be standing in a different place. Um, I be, I've been writing this. I wrote this. It took me about six years to pull this book together between the research. Uh, and the writing of it, and I was fortunate to find a great publisher, uh, Academic Studies Press. My fear had been, I always, when I wrote the book, uh, I knew that there would be more rabbis coming after the publication of the book, to, and that would change the numbers, and that's great. I love, this is a living concept. I mean, there should be more rabbis. My fear as a first-time writer was that uh, there would be um, additional rabbis in praying in Congress between my submission of the manuscript and publication date. Now, I'm not gonna say fortunately, but because of COVID and coronavirus, there have been very few guest chaplains at all in, uh, in Congress over the last, since, since basically since March. So Rabbi Reznikov, when he gives his prayer on Friday, will be the first rabbi uh, since um, early February. And the last rabbi in the house for Rabbi Reznikov is Rabbi Seth Frisch uh, of uh, Philadelphia. Who, by the way, if you get into uh, geeking out on this stuff like I do, that uh, Rabbi Seth Frisch is also the last rabbi to give a prayer in the Senate. Uh, and that was actually some time ago, uh, 2018. So uh, Rabbi Reznikov this Friday, the next rabbi will be the 17th. Rabbi Willens Fields, I'm gonna, um, this might be our last one. Um, rabbi, uh, from, uh, rabbi Rudda, how, how does one go about getting on the chaplain's radar to potentially give the opening prayer? Any advice? So you could be as brave as I was and just speak to your congressman. Probably start with there because there's a smaller pool of people. And it really gives them a lot of um, kavod also for, the, for them because they get honored also and they get to speak about you. And most of our districts are small enough. I don't know where you live. I mean, if I did it now, I live in Chris Smith, the only Republican in New Jersey's district and it's Lakewood and Deal, New Jersey. So lots of rabbis for him to pick from, but if you live in a community with small rabbis, I don't know where you are, just ask your congressperson. Right. It looks like you're in LA from your background though. I, I was in LA, I'm in Dallas now, but when I was okay. in LA, we had two congressmen that were members of the shul. So yeah. maybe I'll talk to them. 
Do we have time for me to make one quick comment, Howard? Sure. Can we, can I, can I, yeah, before you do that, Rabbi, can I, there's one, I, Rabbi Beals has several uh, questions here, and he says, um, has any other Delaware, Delaware rabbis? I just want to point out, let's take 10 seconds, and it won't come in your time. I promise, Rabbi Reznikov. Uh, there has been another Delaware rabbi, and actually, I love the story, uh, Rabbi um, Ellen Barnhart, uh, who was from, um, I think, Reconstructionist and represented, I believe, the Albert Einstein in Delaware, gave her prayer. And I remember this vividly. It was a wonderful prayer, uh, sponsored. And Rabbi Beals, I know you're close uh, to uh, uh, Joe Biden, uh, so I'll, I'll say this <laughs> gently. Uh, but the sponsoring remarks that Joe Biden made about uh, Rabbi Barnhart were about three or four times as long as the prayer itself. And it, 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 was, it was quite comprehensive on Joe Biden's own personal life in Delaware. Beautiful remarks, but quite lengthy. Okay, Rabbi Resnikov, I'm gonna have you- Typical. The, uh, so, <laughs> Rabbi Beals, okay, but nice. To, I've seen you many times in the C-SPAN, Rabbi Beals. Nice to uh, and <laughs> I went a couple other places. Nice to meet you in person. And you've obviously have given the prayer. And it was Senators Carper and Coons who both gave remarks about you on the floor of the Senate that day. So nice. There's a you. long bot for they sat through. Yeah, I'm going to buy the book. I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, Rabbi Esnikov, you get as we uh, you get the final word, and then we'll close it out uh, after you, my friend. Well, just one comment, trivia about the prayers, and then one personal experience. Trivia is, as many of you probably know, uh, if, if three days pass without a session, the president can jump on that and make a, uh, a, an appointment or a session appointment. Uh, so both the House and the Senate hold a session every three days or so, even if the, they're not in order, even though if the House Senate is not in order, just so the president cannot uh, do that. The trivia is that when the Senate does that, they don't have a prayer. But when the House has it, they do. And so some of the prayers I've given in the House are called pro forma session, where the prayer may be almost the entire uh, day. I mean, they introduce the, the speaker pro tem, they introduce the prayer, and then they close. However, this is the personal, the, the one prayer that I ask special permission to change, Ellen mentioned you have to give it in advance and have them look at it. When I gave the last prayer of 2019, the last rabbi prayer, um, the attack on the uh, Muncie Jews took place on a Saturday and Shabbat, and then the attack on a church in Texas occurred the next day. So I asked permission to change that. I talked about the anti-Semitism, the hatred, and I ended with the words of Martin Luther King Jr., we shall overcome. And even though it was pro forma and almost nobody was there, that ended up on CNN and probably is the most well-known prayer that I've ever given in Congress. So you never know who's looking and they're including Howard Mortman. So these prayers are uh, recognized and listened to by many other people. So the big takeaway as I turn this back over, uh, I think as we end and turn it back over to Steve, the big takeaway from Rabbi Reznikov just said, if anybody of you want to offer prayers in Congress, you need to move to Washington DC or the suburbs and be on call for a pro forma session and really run up the numbers uh, from there. Is that the, the big takeaway from that message, uh, Rabbi Reznikov? Well, I hope it's because they like my prayers also, not just because I'm in DC, but it, yeah, it does help that I can say yes quickly. Very good, okay. Um, I think, Steve, are you there? Do I turn it back over to you? Is there anything? Um, 